Commissioner Skinner is here for the first time in his new capacity uh, in Vienna. Uh, I understand that he is more or less on a on a route of capital, um, which uh, is part of of, of uh, trying to find solutions to difficult issues. As you know, he is responsible in the Commission for coordinating. Uh, issues like migration, uh, security, but also education, skills training. Uh, the uh, new commission uh, has a task, and the task is uh, to coordinate better the work of the European Union and to communicate better. That has always been a, uh, an issue for the commission. Uh, and uh, we uh, agreed that Commissioner Schinas will speak about priorities of the von der Leyen Commission and especially on the notion what will it include to speak about a geopolitical European Commission, an issue uh, which has been around as a point of discussion very long, but as we know, it's uh, the member countries <coughs> will finally make decisions on how geopolitically uh, the Commission uh, can be. But uh, actually, uh, I should only introduce, and I say a few words of uh, the biography of, of Commissioner Skinas. He, uh, he is from Thessaloniki, uh, and uh, after studies in uh, Greece and in, in uh, London at the LSE, he has been working for the Commission in various functions for 20 years, as, as I understand. Uh, and in between, he had a political job for a few years uh, as member of European Parliament for Nea Democratica, so for the Conservative uh, Party uh, in Greece. Uh, and now he has uh, been commissioner since uh, November or December uh, of last year. Uh, and uh, as I said, he's responsible uh, for promoting the European way of life. Uh, and uh, you may have may be aware that uh, even the title of his uh, position was uh, not easily found. Originally, it was called for the securing the promotion the, the European way of life, and the compromise was for promoting the European way of life. Uh, so uh, let us ask Commissioner Skinas how he sees his work in the priorities of the new commission, uh, and let us hope that it will be a successful commission. Commissioner Skinas, the, work, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, I think I couldn't have uh, found a better way to start my full day in Vienna than uh, with a chat uh, to the Vienna Diplomatic Academy. After all, I think uh, I've never given a, a presentation to an entity that dates back to the 18th century. So this is a first for me. This is a very modern room, but I know that this institution is, is one of the uh, pillars of, uh, uh, of European uh, international relations and uh, our European way of uh, uh, placing ourselves in the very context, in the very complicated context of international relations. So I'm delighted to be here and thank you for sharing this moment with me. Um, let me first start by saying that um, each political cycle in Brussels is sealed by a central theme, by an overarching objective. I am uh, old hand enough to remember the political cycle of integration, uh, which was completing the enlargement, uh, moving to a fully fledged common currency. These years of integration were behind us. And then uh, a new political cycle opened. Let's call it the Juncker years, where the key theme was the poly crisis, the crisis. This was the years when Europe was hit, shaken by uh, a number of very intense, profound, successive, and largely uh, unpredicted crises, like the very difficult negotiation with a new radical government in Greece that brought both Greece and the Eurozone at the brink of the abyss, the biggest movement of population in Europe after the end of uh, Second World War with the collapse of Syria and the one million desperate people who fled war and found themselves from one day to the other from the Aegean to the Vienna and Munich railway station. Then we have jihadi terrorism, not in the Middle East, but in the streets of Brussels, Paris, Nice, 
then we had the negotiation with Prime Minister Cameron, then we had Brexit, then we had uh, Trump. I mean, put this together, and that's the story of the poly crisis. Uh, but this <coughs> cycle also ended, <coughs> and uh, ended, I would say, with a, a rather solid and sober conclusion, which is that Europe and the Union <coughs> proved much more resilient, much more resistant than many of our uh, distractors, enemies, doomsayers, Cassandras, catastrophologists, declinologues, you can choose the word you like, uh, have hoped for or predicted. You know, uh, It didn't happen their way. Europe proved much more resilient, much more resistant during these years. And now, as the ambassador rightly said, as of 1st December, the new team is in place. A new political cycle opens in Brussels. And if you were to ask me what's the central theme mm -hmm. of this new cycle, I would tell you without any doubt that the key word for the next five years is transition. This will be the commission that would have to prepare the transition of our union. Obviously, the question that follows is transition to where? And the transition has to be, I think, uh, triple, it has to have uh, three destinations. The first, uh, without any doubt, is the transition to green Europe. Uh, the European Green Deal that we put forward last December and we will be uh, specifying in the years to come uh, sets a very clear goal of Europe becoming the first, uh, probably the only uh, decarbonized continent on Earth by 2050. We have previous targets in 2030. We have a very extensive investment program on green economy with a just transition fund. And we have a gradual greening of uh, uh, our lives. It is not green Europe. It's not about climate targets. It's about the way we are, the way we live, the way we organize our behavior as consumers, as businesses, as society, as citizens. Um, and by the way, the green transition will not wait until 2050. It's happening already now because uh, markets, the reality, imposes a certain sense of behavior and pattern that is faster than the political time. Let me give you some examples. Uh, the European Investment Bank does not finance any longer fossil energy projects. Uh, the financial sector, uh, private banks, even if you are a car maker and you want money from them, they would ask you to show them your green portfolio. And my younger son, who is 23rd, prohibited us at home to buy bottled water. He said, this is a crime. This is a sin. And we, of course, complied. So this is happening. It's happening. It's the, the first transition is happening. So the, the European Union will frame it, but the, 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 the sequence is, is, has started, and we're going very fast. Second transition <laughs> is the digital transition. This is already also happening, because we started with a digital single uh, market for the first time in Europe. We have a European copyright law. We have abolished geo-blocking that allows uh, digital services to be uh, cheaper and more diverse. But there are two technological game changers that are anteportas that would also have a profound impact on our lives. First is 5G <coughs> technologies, and second, artificial intelligence. 5G technology will connect everything to everything and everything to everyone. In 10 years' time, the world, because of 5G, would have 500 billion interconnected devices. Not only computers at home or at the office, but the Internet of Things, um, our homes, our private sphere. So this is a world which is approaching us fast. 
And although it's a world of opportunities, at the same time, it's also a world of huge risks in terms of uh, unimaginable flows of personal data that will be circulating in this new technological environment, but also of huge geopolitical risks and as the potential for malicious interventions in this global uh, ultra-fast web would be extremely easy to organize and very difficult to prevent. So framing the 5G would be another thing for this commission. Parallel to that, we will also have artificial intelligence. In the years to come, we all have to uh, decide or convince ourselves but other than the family and friends we have, we will have a new friend in life, or frenemy, which will be called algorithm. Algorithms will be shaping many things of our life as we know it. Algorithms will be delivering things for us, services, but at the same time, algorithms are constructed to get more intelligent as they operate. So there will be a constant improvement of algorithms that would <laughs> affect the way we provide services, the way we shop, the way we vote, the way we think, the way we have access to public services. So, the way we think. sorry? The way we think. That would be the end result unless we find a way to frame algorithms in a system that would be always anthropocentric, that means people, controlled by people, and with the strictest respect of our privacy and personal data. And this is something that only Europe can do for us. This is part of the digital transition. Creating the opportunities, but also closing the loopholes and making sure that the security aspects attached to it can work. <coughs> And the third transition, which is closer to my areas of uh, responsibility in the new team, is the transition to what we one could call more resilient and cohesive societies for the future. If you ask Europeans, and we do uh, often, uh, how do they imagine their lives in the future, they would, and I'm now oversimplifying for the sake of our discussion, they mainly tell us two things, security and opportunities. That's, that's what Europeans dream for themselves. And this is important because it requires, it puts pressure on the European and the national, of course, policy-making level to provide just that. This is what Emmanuel Macron in his famous uh, Sorbonne speech said, we need une Europe qui protège, a Europe that protects, a Europe which people see as a shield, as an umbrella against the many different threats in the horizon. But at the same time, we also need une Europe de levier, something that we can use as a leverage that can multiply opportunities for us in terms like education, skills, youth, public health. Look around you, look around you. And you will see that on any of these issues, Europe can multiply, can give more than take back. Uh, coronavirus, uh, skills, mobility, languages, opportunities. This is an area uh, that is there this transition to these new societies is out there for us to use. For the first time, uh, Ursula von der Leyen has created the vice presidency in the commission that brings together all these elements of the Europe that protects and the Europe that empowers together, bundled together. Uh, I'm the first one to admit, although an old Brussels hand, that for many years these uh, work streams have been developed in a silo uh, mentality. So unconnected uh, to one another. But now the moment has come to sort of uh, fertilize our work in these areas and try to create this end result, which I have the ambition to call the European way of life. 
And let me close with this uh, uh, notion. I'm sure that you all followed this schizophrenic and often self-flagellating debate that, preceded, that followed my appointment as to what is today the European way of life. So we Europeans managed to argue even over something that the rest of the world admires us for. So there was this tendency, especially I would say from the left of the political spectrum in Europe, to project the European way of life as a us against the others narrative. Some sort of bulldozer politics, that Skinas will jump on a bulldozer and will crush everyone who is not like us. But that's the easy thing to do, and I would say the cheap thing to do, to attack the notion of the European way of life. And I regret for not having uh, come out very strongly to, to uh, defend this argument, because I had my hearing in Parliament, I preferred to do it before the MEPs rather than to do it in the press. But when the moment came, and I, I did it uh, at the European Parliament, I had the occasion to say, and I'll finish with that, that for me the European way of life is not a bulldozer, it's a mirror that reflects our diversity, our richness, our cultural traditions, the fact that we come from so many different perspectives, but deep down we are strong because we are not a homo europeus. We are Europe because we are different. And th there is no better way of seeing this as looking at ourselves calmly and saying who we are. What do we represent today? We represent democracy, respect of minorities, the role of women in the society, in the family, in the workplace, is guaranteed. We have universal systems of education and health care. We take care of our elderly. We are the world's champions of human rights and data protection. And there is no death penalty. Bits and pieces of all this you can find elsewhere too. All of this together, you will only find it in Europe. And this is the European way of life. So we can sort of fight over it. We can self-flagellate. We can say we need more. I, I'm, I'm fully on board with all this. But to attack ourselves because we defend the principles that make us important, that I do not accept. And I will, I will fight to, to defend it or promote it, uh, de depending on, on where you are in this side of the argument. So I stop here. I think I spoke too much. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, including the socialists, uh, the liberals, uh, the uh, European People's Party, and even the Greens, who were not governing in Austria at the time, I must say, but even the Greens in the European Parliament did not vote against the Commission. They abstained, and there were 10 of them that voted in, for, uh, in favor. So I, I would say that now we have a moment uh, where the legitimacy of the project is <laughs> well grounded. We have enough, uh, more than enough backing in the European Parliament to take it further. And to answer your question, I think, indeed, there is now, the moment is now ripe to start from content and let the people find the right labels. A, a common pathology in European politics in the past was that first we were starting <coughs> with a label and then the content did not always add up. So I think that these themes, the transitions, the Europe that protects, the Europe that empowers, and the Europe of ambition in a world that is becoming more and more uncertain, more and more insecure. Uh, this is what gives us uh, more leverage. The, the notion of a geopolitical commission is not a notion that relies on EU air carriers or EU fire, uh, fighter jets or EU frigates. Sorry to break the news, we do not have any. The geopolitical commission relies on our ability to lead as a force of good that frames the transitions, that guarantees open and free trade, rules-based <coughs> international order. That's where our geopolitical added value uh, lies, I think. Thank you. Before I open the, for questions, one more issue, because I think most of the priorities of, of uh, the commission uh, and what you said uh, is very much in line with the present government in Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy to very much <laughs> <laughs> regarding the green deal, but also regarding uh, protecting and, and promoting. That's for sure. Uh, but there is uh, there is one issue where you might have a problem. Uh, we all want this in Austria, but we don't want to pay more than one percent of our <laughs> national cross national <laughs> product. So what are you going to do about this? Well. Um, Thank God, this is not my <laughs> my job. It's not. It's, it's the job of the Austrian commissioner, by the way, uh, Gio Hahn, who has a very busy uh, moment now, because he is preparing the fin the final uh, arbitrage. As you know, we have an extraordinary uh, European Council, an extraordinary summit of EU heads of state and government for the 20th of uh, December next Thursday. Our Prime Minister cannot <coughs> attend the Opera Ball because he has to go to Brussels. Yes, yes, but guess what? I will attend the Opera Ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I think there is an opportunity. There is a window of opportunity uh, for the Union to get an agreement now. I think it would be nice to take this deal out of the way so that we can concentrate on the rest. I think that if we leave this too open for the German presidency, there will be too much uh, piling up. Uh, you should also know that this new multi-annual financial framework needs to be in place by the 1st of January. So the earlier we, uh, we have it, the better. And there, I'm very familiar, and this is a pattern that emerges every seven years when we have this negotiation. I'm very familiar with the, the dichotomy between the so-called uh, frugal uh, states and the so-called friends of cohesion. The, these are the, the two blocks. But I want to go beyond this traditional dichotomy and present with you, share with you what I would like to see in all this. I would like to see a situation where all our member states consider themselves as joint shareholders of a company which is called the European Union. If you are a joint shareholder of a company, you have a common interest to bring the price of the stock up because everybody wins. If you try with your behavior individually 
to bring the stock down, everybody loses. So this is the moment where this mentality of the joint ownership, the joint stockholders mentality should emerge. I can give you 1,000 examples of how better off we would be, but I will give you only one. One of the things that we need is to protect our borders, right? And we now have an opportunity to do that because we have moved from Frontex to a, a fully-fledged European border and coast guard with 10,000 permanent staff, with EU uniforms, uh, guns, their own equipment. These would be the living example of the Europe that protects our borders. And this is something that is universally claimed, especially from the frugals, I would say. So now that the moment comes to find the money for that, we cannot tell our people, you know, we changed our mind now. There will be no 10,000, there will be 2,000. Because then we are not credible. And if we're not credible with responsibility, we'll not have solidarity. So it's like the dog that bites its tail. We have to have this common mentality, this communality of interest to get this done. And I'm very hopeful uh, that uh, we can make this work. I also noted yesterday, I think, upon arrival that the Chancellor uh, made an opening, which is a, a, a promising start. So that means that this mentality of joint uh, ownership is now taking hold. Let's see. We still have a week to go. Thank you very much. Yes. He, ma he made an opening, but, but some Austrians say we, maybe we need an Austrian rebate. You know this sort of discussion. That will be for the negotiation. Uh, you know that the negotiation is structured in a way uh, if they will start Thursday, there's a dinner, and there's a long night, and everybody was asked to bring uh, clean shirts, which means that there is a potential to keep talking until agreeing. So let's see. Let, let's stay with the optimistic view. I'm taking questions now, please. Um, do you want me to introduce myself? Uh, yes, please. Uh, George Gassauer, migration editor for the news uh, platform Addendum, and former student of the Diplomatic Academy. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, getting uh, a little closer, could you, uh, considering the situation in Idlib uh, and the situation in Greece, what is the European state of preparedness uh, should another uh, migration wave come uh, in the earlier months of 2020? And the second question is, could you give us a concrete idea of what your uh, new migration pact will look like? Okay, I'll start with the second leg of the question, um, and you will allow me because this uh, discussion we're having is before I meet uh, the Chancellor and the Minister, so I do not want to front load publicly uh, things that we'll have to discuss uh, uh, within a political setting, but what I can tell you on the overall philosophy of the new pact is first that we have to learn from the lessons of the past, because we tried, as you know, and we failed to have a comprehensive migration policy. We now have a patchwork of regulatory solutions that do different things in different parts of our geography, but still we do not have a comprehensive uh, uh, policy framework. So we are thinking of a holistic package, uh, of a new beginning, of a fresh start, that would have three fundamental dimensions. First, I think we need to start with an external dimension from the countries of origin and transit, where the root causes of the migratory uh, phenomenon uh, exist. Europe does a lot there, but not that much, so that people can get more opportunities, a better future in their countries of origin rather than put their lives in the hands of the smugglers in the Mediterranean. So we need to do much more in Africa and in our neighborhoods to offer better opportunities to these people and work with the governments to organize better their migratory flows. That's stage one. Stage two is what I was referring to earlier. We need to have a robust management of our external border. It is unfair that these migratory pressures now, or flows, because I don't like the word pressure, this is not a war, it's a phenomenon, uh, uh, 
is left with the countries of first entry, we need to have a robust European convincing uh, system for controlling and patrolling our borders, hence the importance of having a fully fledged European border and coast guard in place. And finally, the third element of the new pact would have to be a solidarity element, where <coughs> uh, <coughs> member states would share amongst themselves the responsibility <coughs> and the burden of processing asylum claims. Because as you know, we still have very outdated laws in Europe on asylum that date back from an era where very few people were claiming asylum in Europe. Those fleeing the Greek or the Spanish dictatorships, for example. So at the time, it made sense to say that uh, the Dublin asylum rules would compel only the countries of first entry to process asylum uh, applications. But this is no longer the case. Europe is at the heart of a global migratory movement that will <coughs> be with us in the years to come. So we have to have a solidarity system that would allow us to share. So it's important that the pact has these three dimensions together, woven into a, a coherent framework. I think we would be better advised not to undo this cohesiveness, because there are many things which appeal to different uh, member states. In a nutshell, what I can tell you is that Europe will continue to be an asylum destination. This is what defines <coughs> us. This is who we are. We people that suffer persecution, war, should know that Europe will always be a guarantor of the right of asylum. But at the same time, those who are not entitled to international protection in Europe should know that they cannot stay with us and they will have to go back. And hence, we also need a, a comprehensive system for returns of those who have no right to be in Europe. So these are our early thinking on, on the pact. We'll see the details uh, uh, in a few weeks and, and, and months. Now, you're asking me on Idlib and the situation there. And the state of preparedness. And the state of preparedness. Uh, in the last five years, I was the chief spokesperson of the commission, and I was systematically refusing to answer any questions that start with if, what happens if and if. So this is a situation that I is, is an if uh, situation. Um, leaving the ifs aside, uh, concentrating on the facts, one should not forget that Turkey today hosts around 4 million Syrian, refu Syrian refugees on their territory. With our money, with our assistance, but they do, and in, in decent conditions. So in an ideal, in a positive reading of the situation, depending, regardless of how things go in Idlib, there is this hope that Turkey will continue as the immediate neighbor with our help to accommodate uh, these uh, movements. Uh, if this is not the case and we have an eruption, I think that would be, uh, uh, of course, uh, more difficult for Europe. But it's also true that Europe finds ourselves in a better situation now as in 2015. In 2015, we didn't, we didn't have uh, hotspots. We didn't have ways to organize ourselves in the countries of first entry. Now we have uh, a certain uh, structure, certain capacity, and although we do not have the pact, uh, I think we, we would be better advised to work with what we have, hoping that we will not reach this point. So Europe is prepared? I would say more, be more prepared than 2015. And okay. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Um, um. Hello, my name is Stella Wittmann. Um, I'm working in an NGO for plastic reduction, and I wanted to come back uh, on your son's yes. um, saying uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that um, selling uh, plastic bottles is a crime. I wanted to ask you uh, that you adjust um, the parts of the Green Deal and the plastic strategy uh, for whole Europe. Uh, because it takes such a long time uh, till we get the redemption value. Um, plus, uh, you should m make more efforts uh, to get, uh, get uh, free drinking water fountains. And also, which is um, a big
big crime, uh, what I think is uh, uh, selling those uh, fireworks. Uh, those are prohibited in Vienna to shoot, but they are selling it. So how uh, can you uh, follow the um, prohibition if you are selling it? So um, it, it, it must be uh, prohibited to sell in order not to fire it. And uh, this destroys all the biodiversity. So I would ask you uh, to, to make uh, these laws quicker because um, uh, we are over 50. <laughs> And if it takes you such a long time for the next law, then we will not survive that. Because I'm, I'm, yeah, because I'm working on that since 2014. I was at Commissioner Potocznik, and so it took six years to make this uh, law with the plastic bags. And if, if all this will go on for such a long time, you cannot do that. Thank you. No, I, I agree with you. Just to be fair to my son, he didn't say selling b bottled water is a crime. He said it buying is a crime. <laughs> <laughs> and I also agree that uh, the political time uh, in Brussels is often uh, more, mm, is slower than, than expectations. Not only in the area you mentioned, in many areas. Uh, Often the European Union is like a, a cruise ship to, mm. to shift, uh, to turn. There is a need for a certain time. But once the maneuver happens, I can assure you that the course is, is steady. And banning plastics is something that is a, a, an unwavering commitment of the Commission. Already the last Commission had this very comprehensive plastic strategy, which is now uh, fully implemented. And there again, I think market realities are somehow faster than the legislative time. Let's, let's hope that we will go uh, uh, faster and we'll keep the course. Yes, please. Um, good morning, my name is Josef Lusse. I'm a student here at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, let me start out by saying thank you very much for taking the time this morning uh, to come here. Um, I have a question with regards to um, the third point, the transition towards um, more resilient and cohesive societies. Uh, which are based on security and opportunities. I think security is quite clear, uh, border protection and so on. Opportunities uh, was a bit more vague. Uh, opportunities always sound very nice, everybody likes opportunities. Uh, but, but what precisely do you mean with uh, these opportunities? Who do they address? Young people, uh, migrants, uh, both? Uh, and uh, especially how would they differ from the existing opportunities? For instance, for young people, Erasmus, um, uh, the, the ability to be able to move freely within the European Union. Uh, so, so what would the von der Leyen Commission add to the existing opportunities to achieve this goal of um, uh, cohesive and resilient societies? Thank you for this question. Indeed, you're absolutely right. I was a bit uh, synoptic on the opportunity side because I wanted to privilege the Q&A, but I'm happy now to, to expand. Uh, there are certain distinguished tracks uh, in, in opportunities. First, there is the mobility track. Europe should do everything we can to foster mobility. Mobility is a richness for Europe. It's, it's, it's a political treasure for Europe. All sorts of mobility, but of course uh, the, the jewel and the crown is the Erasmus uh, project which is, as you know, is no longer purely educational uh, project of mobility, but it covers also uh, professional exchanges, training, and so on and so forth. Um, so far, we have 10 million Europeans who benefited from an Erasmus experience. I'm sure some of, the, some of them would be in this room. Our ambition in the next seven years, if everything goes well next Thursday, is to triple this amount of money. So pass switch from 15 to 45 billion euros for mobility through Erasmus in the next seven years, which will bring up the number of uh, beneficiaries to 20, 25 million. This is the best investment in terms of opportunities. <coughs> this is understanding each other. This is benefiting from each other. This is importing knowledge experience uh, back home. And there are two little brothers of the Erasmus uh, program that uh, the younger crowd here should have in mind. The European Solidarity Corps, which allows young Europeans 
to travel within Europe to provide voluntary work and emer on emergency situations, but also in terms of cultural uh, and, and societal projects. And we also have Discover EU, which is uh, an opportunity that the EU budget will provide to all Europeans turning 18 to travel in the European Union for some time to understand better other member states. So this is one track of opportunity, mobility. Another track is skills. Europe will need in the next years a skills revolution. Because for these transitions that I was describing to you, there will be tremendous pressure on our society to produce a set of skills that we do not have. Only on digital, we will need something like 250,000, 300,000 digital workers <coughs> in Europe that our companies do not have. And when I say skills revolution, I want to be very frank. This is also linked to the European way of life. This should not be only for those who have the privilege to have easy access to training systems, trade unions, membership, so-called the people who are in the system. This skills revolution should also concern those who are cut off from reskilling and upskilling. Populations living in rural areas, in mountainous areas. Our elderly, our senior Europeans, the, they also have the right to catch up with uh, the technological evolution to uh, uh, skilling opportunities. So second track, skills. And third track uh, of uh, uh, opportunities is education. We have now a central uh, goal to produce a European education area by 2025 which will uh, rely on what we call European University Alliances, which are alliances of European universities that are coming together to produce common curricula and to converge on common degrees. And part of this European education area, of course, would be to allow for uh, a mobility of teachers and higher education personnel within these alliances. The sooner we move to these uh, opportunities, the better. And uh, uh, we're not yet there. This is only, only the beginning. And finally, I don't want to forget this. We also have a duty of inclusion to the new Europeans, let's call them like this, the people who will stay with us because they have been granted uh, asylum protection in Europe. And since they have the right and they are incorporating into our societies, they will have to contribute to our social security. They have to be part of the skilling process. They have to be given job opportunities. And of course, they have to assume all the obligations uh, that European citizens uh, have. So this is the spectrum of a Europe that empowers. Yes, please. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. You, you need a mic. I don't need this thing. I think. I <laughs> speak enough. Strong enough. Uh, speak up for this room. Uh, I have a special question, and uh, I think you are in security also. Yes. So, if there is a case happening in Austria for prosecution. Uh, which uh, possibility you have to have the um, control about this case from the outside of Austria? Because we have a case now going on, um, it's a criminal case, and it's about uh, how certain lobbies try to bring people out of their flats. So, um, real estate lobbies. What they do, they use something very unusual now in the last time. And this is the way how to radiate the sleeping room of the person. The radiation in a very high, you know, in a very high, uh, 
there are certain way how you can do that. And, uh, and I have been into that research. I, I can prove they do that the thing really. It's a concrete and it's on the court. So um, So what is the question? The question is how the first question was already done. How can the person who is working in the level of European Union <coughs> in this kind of responsibility do something about that? Okay, I'm, I'm, yeah. thank you. I'm, I'm not familiar with the, with the specifics of the case you mentioned, but as a general systemic <coughs> observation, I will tell you that the European Union cannot control national judicial proceedings or police investigations. These are for the national authorities, there is no way that the European Union can sort of uh, replace a national judge. But there is a door that opens uh, the community law, the sphere of community law, which is something that the treaty provides, which is called uh, a, a, refella, a referral to the European Court uh, of uh, Justice, which relies on the judge, on the national judge, an Austrian judge, a, a Spanish judge, in a certain case, if the judge thinks that the case in itself raises issues of community competence that have a broader European uh, dimension, the judge stops the proceedings and does a referral to the European Court of Justice and waits for the European Court of Justice to offer an opinion. So, but this very much depends on the specifics of this case and on whether the case has this European dimension. There is a commissioner. Uh, Sorry, I, I have to take the next one. Yes, I can, I can, we can discuss bilaterally. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, here. And then over there. Thank you very much. I want to come back to the discussion of the EU budget. Why don't you say that you have been uh, training with us? Yeah, I've been uh, <laughs> a training with the SPP, so the spokesperson says. That's it. Um, but my question is about the EU budget. And I would like to know, isn't the discussion a bit absurd that we're talking about either it's 1.0%, 1.1% of GMP, when we consider that member states um, spend about 40% on the national, regional, and um, like local level. What is miss like maybe what is missing is that national leaders don't see the bigger picture of why we need to spend more in Europe for common project in order to compete on the global level. Thank you. Well, yes, you see, we we indoctrinated <laughs> him. <laughs> we indoctrinated him during his uh, stage. Yes. Okay. On no, I would not say it is absurd. No, it's not absurd, because I I have the greatest respect of uh, discussions about money. Uh, nothing when you discuss money is absurd. Uh, everything makes sense. But I would put it differently. I would say, why are we at one percent? Because we are funding through the EU budget things, only the things that are of community competence. We do not fund uh, a European healthcare service <coughs> because there is no European healthcare. We do not fund a European education service because this is also national. And most importantly, we do not fund a European defense budget. So if these are the big pockets that make the big money. So we fund everything that is of EU competence. And then I agree, we have to fund at the level of our ambition. Hence the example I gave you of Frontex, there are, there are many others. Erasmus is another good example. Every leader says that Erasmus is a fantastic thing, but now let's see if they put their mouth, if they put their pocket where their mouth is, tripling the fund. So, no, it's not absurd, but it's, it, it pertains to, to who we are and what we budget. Just to give you an order of magnitude, the United States federal budget is 22% of the, of the American GDP. 
and we are struggling here with 1.1. 1 .1. This is United States of America. But this is the United, the United States of, of Europe. Europe. That's it. That's that's the answer. Because the 20 percent is like the U.S. Army. It's like well, they don't have a U.S. healthcare system yet. Imagine if they would have a U.S. healthcare system. So that's that's how I explain these discussions. Just the last row. The last row there was one. Klaus Pröper is a freelance journalist. Can I ask you, Commissioner, you are promoting common European values. How to combine the values which are represented by, for example, Viktor Orban and Emmanuel Macron? What are their common values in your side? Yes, this is, uh, with all due respect, a journalistic uh, <laughs> approach to the common values. I think when I was referring to what makes us big, everything that I said appeals to both uh, Macron and Orban. Huh? I don't think that any of them doubts that we are democracies, protect minorities, we have the rule of woman, no death penalty. Anyway, there are variations. But what matters, what matters is what the Hungarian people and what the French people believe on Europe and where they find their way in this world. If you look at the numbers, both the French and the Hungarians share the belief that their countries have to be parts of a united Europe, of the European Union. For me, this is what matters. This is the, the, the legitimacy route. This is the, the route that feeds the tree. And politicians come and go, but the tree uh, remains the same. We have to keep it alive. And of course, you know that we have uh, work and instruments like the rule of law, Article 7 in the treaty. We have infringement procedures that allow us to, to monitor and, um, um, how should I say, handle cases where we think that the government goes against our policies, against our values. And we have done it with a certain success. But, um, OK, I take this point. Uh, there are certain political leaders who have a certain tendency to, to view reality and democracy differently. I know what I'm talking about because as the commission spokesman for the last five years, I have been repeatedly vilified. And I saw my face uh, also in, in billboards and in the dark internet saying that I am uh, the man of this and the man of that. And, uh, uh, but this is also part of the democratic game. Fritz Lechleuchner. Um, I think the number six priority of uh, von der Leyen is the democracy in Europe. Could I ask you, on your point of view, what your particular area of responsibility can do for this? Yes. Or can we turn this into the question of institutions and their future? That's, uh, first of all, congratulations for having this thorough uh, <laughs> notion of the uh, von der Leyen priorities. Indeed, uh, the, the political priority number six is called democracy and demography, uh, which are uh, two, uh, this uh, vice president is the Croatian vice president, the Dubravka Sucha, who is in charge, and is the first attempt also to, uh, for the European Union to address issues that pertain to our democratic societies and, and the demographic challenges. Let me start with demography first. Europe today represents 8% of the world population and declining. We still account for 20% of the world's GDP. And interestingly enough, Europe accounts for 50%, 5 half of world social spending. So one in two dollars spent on Earth, on social policy, is spent in Europe. This is the Europe that our previous generations inherited to us. So the main now challenge 
is for us to give to our children and grandchildren a similar level of success, if you like, demographic, economic, and social. And the key parameter, be under no illusion, would be demography. Because unless we maintain a certain demographic uh, uh, growth, the rest will not be easy. So hence, the op occasion for the European Union to start discussing with member states more active demographic uh, uh, policies. Uh, not doing it from Brussels, but financing and facilitating everything that is demography-friendly uh, national initiative. Now on democracy, there is an ongoing discussion about uh, uh, not the level of democracy in our member states, the previous uh, 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 speaker mentioned this, but on the level of democracy of our system, on, of our European democracy will evolve. And there are certain issues that I'm sure that you have discussed here in the academy, like the, the Spitzenkandidaten system where the new leaders of the European Commission should be somehow uh, baptized to uh, the European elections, uh, things like that. To address these uh, democracy issues, also following a, uh, an initiative by Emmanuel Macron, we are launching this year, on the 9th of May, Europe Day, a conference on the future of Europe which will be a conference that will bring together governments, European and national parliamentarians, but more importantly, will also be uh, uh, brought at the national and regional level through a, a program of town hall type meetings, of Agora uh, meetings, where normal people will discuss Europe instead of uh, Brussels types with suits, just like me now, <laughs> coming to evangelize uh, uh, the people. It has to be done the other way around. We have to give access to society, to ordinary citizens. They should be heard. They are the ones who tell us how they view democracy. And another risk that we need to avoid in this conference on the future of Europe is to avoid giving an impression that this will be about Brussels talking to Brussels. You know, this is very often happens where we have these new initiatives, there is a certain self-sufficiency and insolence that, okay, we know better, we'll sort it out. No, it has to be an open process. Democracy is not about officials, ministers, and parliamentarians discussing amongst themselves. We need to inject a more uh, normal, ordinary, societal input. So I, I'm hopeful that this conference will, will produce something. Thank you. I like you I too. Like Thank one. you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Wasn't that the same thing in 2017 down there? Yes and no. In the dialogue? Yes and no. At the time we called it the, how was it? It was the convention. We were at the European convention. And it was, I say, more or less, mm -hmm. yes, because this convention was um, an assembly of ministers. Each member state had a delegation of ministers, members of the European Parliament, members of national parliament, and some talented individuals, professors. And the chair of the convention, as you probably remember, was Valérie Ziscard d'Estaing. And this convention produced what became the Constitution of Europe, which was voted down, if I, might, if I can <laughs> remind you, uh, uh, in France and in what else? Yeah, in the Netherlands, yes. So, so many experts here, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so this is something that then we tried to recapture with the Treaty of uh, Nice, uh, and the Treaty of Lisbon, rather, the Treaty of Lisbon, where the Sarkozy uh, presidency <coughs> sort of uh, found their way out. And frankly, uh, I don't think I, uh, I don't want to insult anyone, but I think this was not the right method. 
this was not the right method. We have to do it differently now. We have to do it as, as more of a people's process from society up, bottom up, not top down, and injecting some <coughs> more healthy uh, citizens' input rather than a discussion amongst the Brussels uh, Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> this is a huge issue. It is, it is, it is, it is. And not an easy one. <coughs> Sorry, I've got. Yes, yes, please. Thank you, Carmen Hagen. I'm a med medical doctor here in Vienna. Um, I was wondering a bit that when it comes to increasing opportunities, you were not really focusing on increasing the biggest still discriminated sub uh, popul pop population we've got um, who are women. So my question is, um, could you explain a little bit about your strategies on increasing the opportunities um, of women in Europe and to work towards um, gender equality? Yes, let me tell you a, a story that probably you don't know. <laughs> um, part of my vice presidency of my portfolio uh, was also equality. That uh, head the commissioner, the Maltese Commissioner for Equality and Gender Balance, which is Elena Dali, that was with me. But as we were coming at the end of the final vote of the commission, uh, the liberal family, uh, Renew, uh, asked the president for this equality portfolio to pass from my vice presidency to Vera Jourova, the, the Czech uh, vice president, who is also liberal because they thought that this equality is closer to the liberal cause. And um, the president agreed. So this is no longer with me. Instead, at, in this uh, final switch of competencies, I was given the responsibility uh, for fight against antisemitism and the dialogue with churches. So this was a, a final sweep that uh, prevents me from being in charge of the equality portfolio which I for which I have prepared well I must say <laughs> and uh, it is something that is very close to me um, I agree that there is still uh, work to be done on uh, gender balance in Europe although I'm very proud of the uh, of the fact that Europe represents uh, a continent that has done a lot uh, for women what I think needs still to be addressed is, and this is in our work program, we'll do it, is to attack the structural factors that differentiate still pay between men and women in Europe. There is a pay uh, gap that we need to address. So this will be uh, an initiative already for this year. And uh, Helena Daly and Vera Jourova, my colleagues, will also put forward a comprehensive gender uh, strategy that would come at the end of this year. So this is indeed uh, uh, a priority, but unfortunately not with me any longer. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Sinkinel. I'm with the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. Um, Commissioner, I would like to go back to the geopolitical dimension that you have mentioned before, especially when it comes, when it comes to the uh, digital transition. Um, when you mentioned geopolitical risks associated to this transition, can you probably elaborate a little bit what are those risks and what the current commission is doing to mitigate them? Thank you. Well, yes, I can, although uh, speaking publicly on security is, no, is not probably the, the wisest thing to do if you are in charge of security. But Chatham House rules, okay. Let's, let's have, let, I, I'll try to share with you my thoughts on this. On, <clears throat> when I said geopolitical risks, clearly, clearly, there is a geopolitical risk in terms of development of 5G technology. Uh, 5G technology is, is a technology which is available in very few providers. Uh, not all of them Europeans. And uh, it goes without saying that when you open the door to a provider 
who does not necessarily share the same uh, values with you, you assume a certain geopolitical risk. It's, it's elementary. That's why we, 10 days ago, we proposed, together with our member states, a toolbox for introducing uh, 5G technology that has a roadmap that allows the Commission and the European Union to check along the steps of introduction of this technology in our member states to make sure that we have in-system in uh, built guarantees for security that make it very difficult to open these uh, doors to the direction we don't want them to, to operate. So this is one thing. Same thing, I would say, goes to the question of cybersecurity and hybr uh, hybrid threats. This is something that is happening already. <coughs> I don't know how many of you know that the day, the very first day, that the new Austrian government was sworn in, the Austrian uh, number of ministries, all their computer systems were attacked. Why? Is it an accident? Why do you think this happened? This is clearly someone saying something. <laughs> <laughs> and saying it's something on the day that matters. Um, another example, I forget the first day that uh, the then president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, visited for the first time the Berlemont, the European Commission headquarters, the whole commission system of uh, uh, computers uh, was attacked. So this is happening. There are many actors, and uh, it is our duty, especially in these new technological uh, horizons that I was referring to earlier, artificial intelligence, that accelerate the possibilities for these attacks to build uh, uh, guarantees and uh, walls into our systems. We will, well, we'll have this uh, weekend in Munich, the Munich Security Conference, where these issues will be discussed in detail. Um, and I would say with everybody around, which is also important to discuss security with everybody around. And we are preparing for June our EU Security Union strategy that would be a comprehensive uh, uh, initiative to address these issues. I mean, I personally add to this, uh, on the issue of fake news, uh, uh, the European Union is trying to improve resilience also there with institutions in various places. Uh, do you have any new plans there? Yeah, there, thank you, Ambassador, for raising this. Uh, there, I think, indeed, you're right, We we were very clear that the era of naivety was over for Europe. Uh, it was too obvious what was happening on this information, and we organized ourselves, I think, uh, intelligently around the European elections, and we proved uh, effective. Uh, these European elections were the first European elections that we didn't have uh, uh, any, any problems. Your question gives me the opportunity to say something else. Very often, a difficulty we have in fighting disinformation and fake news, and I'm telling it as a practitioner because I was involved, is that we found ourselves very alone in Brussels in doing this. Very alone. Because in, cap in the capitals, in our capitals, there is still this mentality that, you know, this is something that is not for its Brussels, is like it's Brussels stuff. Whereas whatever happens there, if Brussels is attacked, if our union is attacked, then we go again to the joint shareholders analogy. There is no way that Brussels and the union is attacked and this does not concern the capitals. This should be seen as, as, as a threat that goes beyond the boundaries of Brussels. So I think this is happening now. <laughs> this is happening, but we need to build trust into our systems, we need to build trust into the intelligence services of our member states, 
you know that the intelligence services of the member states are built in a way not to trust anyone. That's their job. They do not even <laughs> trust uh, many times their national uh, counterparts. <laughs> sometimes rightfully. And, and rightfully. About the NSA well. Exactly. Sometimes rightfully because this is how they operate. But I think we also now, given these challenges and threats, we, we have to show them that we are part of the solution, that we are not out there to replace them or compete with them or antagonize them, but we are there to, to offer uh, added value. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Sofia Maria Satanakis. I'm a colleague uh, of the previous uh, uh, speaker. Uh, I wanted to ask a broader question. Uh, regarding Europe's role and position when it comes to other international actors like China, mostly the United States, Russia, where do you see Europe? Where would you place it? Do you place it in a like struggling position, or do you think it will be possible for Europe to promote our interests uh, actively and hopefully successfully? Thank you. Yes, this is what in California they call a mega question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think I, I, at least I tried to show that the way I see Europe as a geopolitical force is as a force of good, as, a, as an anchor of stability in a world that is becoming more and more unstable. Uh, when uh, I worked with Juncker, I traveled and I attended all G7 and G20 summits for the last five years. And not in the formal meetings, but you know, around these meetings, it was very uh, heartwarming and encouraging to see what people were telling us, uh, like the Canadians, the Australians, the Brazilians, the Argentinians. They were telling us, thank God that you guys are around. That means that, in a way, <laughs> our good our brand name as, as a force of good, as, as a beacon of light, is recognized. It's recognized, understood. Um, our big market, our trade, rules-based uh, operation, all this is a plus. Everybody wants to trade with us. Everybody wants to have deals with us. All these are pluses. Are they enough? That's the question. The answer is, up to a certain extent. <laughs> if we live in a world where the security threats will somehow, and, and the defense threats will somehow be stable, probably we can go away with our soft power appeal for many years and years to come. But if the external atmospherics is getting thicker, if the security threats become more present, if Libya goes wrong, if Idlib goes totally wrong, if something happens here and there, then I'm afraid that soft power and the force of good would not be enough. There people would say, where is Europe? Well, or we say, since there is no Europe, let's seek alternative arrangement. So this is the way I see this. I'm not sure I'm, I was very optimistic or encouraging, but I think it was an honest assessment of where we are. Yes, actually you were relying much more on soft power than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah. hope that, that you are right. <laughs> yeah, the, okay, let's, let me go a, first, uh, a step further. It's an illusion to think that from one day to the other we will have a European defense uh, force. It will not happen. Those who wait for a European army or the Juncker battalions or the von der Leyen fleet will not, this, uh, will not see this happening. But what we can do, and we are already doing it, we have this European Defense Fund. So we're spending money together on developing defense and arms uh, research of European added value. That's good. We have these PESCO missions. That's also good. And as we speak, there is a, a French air carrier, Charles de Gaulle, with a Greek frigate and a Portuguese frigate patrolling the South Mediterranean. This is not an EU mission. This is 
a trilateral uh, cooperation between member states. But in a way, it's still European. So if the soft power is not enough, we can exploit everything we have in terms of hard power to see as much as we can. We still have two questions, I think one, two, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Susanne Brandstetter. I'm from the Ministry of Agriculture, Regions and Tourism here in Austria and also the Austrian Focal Point for EU Communication on Environment. Perhaps you know Green Spider from uh, DG Environment. Uh, and I would like to ask you uh, how you are going to communi communicate your challenges in your new job. Uh, what's new about communication? I think communication is always a bottleneck and it always needs a lot of engagement and motivation to bring the citizens here on the boat uh, to this ambitious plan of this Van Line Commission. I think there are really big topics like EU Green Deal we have to communicate really and to build trust uh, in this field. Uh, this is the question, and I would like to share one concern. Uh, you are responsible for the way of life in Europe, and I think the way of life is a very personal thing. And I, as a citizen of Europe, would not like to be talked what's my way of life here in Austria. So a little bit a tricky issue, perhaps. Thank you. Rest assured, oh, I'm starting from the end, rest assured that I will never interfere with your personal life. <laughs> Uh, this is not uh, uh, the purpose of, of, of my job. Now, on a more serious note, you are touching an issue on which I can speak for hours, communication. I, I think you're right. European Union has been traditionally bad in, in communication. But I think there are three ways that we can do this better. First, and you will be probably surprised to hear this from someone who spent years and years of his life in Brussels. First, we need to de brusselize the European Union. Take the European Union out of Brussels. Good idea. Yes. How are you doing it? You're doing it by doing many things like the one we're doing now, by launching the European border and coast guard, not in the commission press room, but in a Greek island, by <coughs> taking our stories out of Brussels, where people, normal people, leave and expect answers. That's one thing. The second thing that we need is we need a bit more, or considerably more, emotions in our communication. A bit of storytelling. We come across as very geeky, technical, boring. People with suits, like you know, we need to be a bit more emotional. And there is a way of, of being emotional. You know, I, I, we discovered a few years ago the oldest Erasmus student in Europe. 84 years old, the Spanish gentleman who was studying an Erasmus scholarship in Italy. He himself says it more about Erasmus than anything else. We. We need to, s this is a year where we have a European championship, football championship, and an Olympic year. We need to be able to show our flag a bit more. We need to make Europeans feel Europeans. This guy Bono of the U2, U2 said a sentence that I would have liked to say, but he said it first. He said, Europe is a thought that needs to become a feeling. That's what we need. We need a bit more of the only things we have emotions in Europe are two nights per year, the night of the Eurovision Song Contest, and the Champions League football final. This is where Europeans somehow feel the same. All the rest is still very. <laughs> final question. There is a final question. Yes, hello, it's Andrea Lubacha. I will be starting my master's at the academy here this fall. Good. <laughs> I just want to quickly touch on an aspect that has not been mentioned in regards to geopolitics, which is the situation of the West Balkan 6. Um, so there is a question of orientation of countries that are geographically within Europe and that have been a bit neglected, I'd say. Um, so I think the developments around those countries show that there is a difficulty in finding a decision 
um, geopolitically. So uh, my question would be, what's your assessment on the actual ability to find unanimous decisions and act as one entity of the European Union? Yes, thank you for this question. Uh, we're discussing with the ambassador before coming here. I think um, it would be suicidal for the European Union to miss the opportunity of anchoring the Western Balkans to, to Europe. Uh, there are many positive elements that compel us to do that. First of all, these countries, as you know, um, they have done a lot to facilitate the pre-accession chances, a lot, a lot. Second, they all have huge diasporas that are mainly European diasporas, and they have a very present organic link with the European Union that should not be missed. And third, because for them, given their ethnical problems and, and the, the, the historic burden that they carry and we carry with them, Churchill got it right that they produce more history that they can consume. <laughs> we need to be able to show them that the perspective is there, is open, is, is for them to seek it. And we failed that. We have to be very uh, honest. Uh, last December we failed that. We somehow moved the goalpost. And this is something that we cannot uh, do again. This was a mistake that should not be repeated. Uh, you saw that uh, ten, yeah, last week we pro proposed a new methodology for accession, which is, I would prefer to call it an accordion methodology, which is more for more, less for less, which, which gives more, more perspective, uh, that concentrates on core uh, deliverables. And I very much hope, really hope, that uh, in the Zagreb summit, in May, we will have an opportunity to correct the mistake of last December. Thank you, Commissioner. I think with the last question, uh, you saw where the priorities of Austria also lie, as far as the European work of the European Commission is concerned. Uh, let's hope for a, a, a strong EU Commission, which will not be easy with the member states the way they are, including <laughs> including Austria, we are, we are very very strong on our, on, our, on, 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 on also reforming the, the European Union, and sometimes very critical about the work of the Commission. Uh, I thank you. I think on behalf of all of us for the for the frank uh, talk you gave and discussion points we made. Uh, we are at the beginning, and I wish you all the best for today's meeting for our <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should wish you all the best for getting some money out of Austrian taxpayers' <laughs> waste coast, uh, but this is a professional school of diplomacy, uh, so I thank you for coming and wish you all the best. Thank you very much.